Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is Martin Hubel, your host of the Evening Tonight Show. And uh, we, here we are on a rather dark Wednesday morning in, in Toronto. The temperature is nice and warm. It's up to about 8 degrees, but uh, we're expecting a huge dump of rain soon. good thing about rain in Toronto is we don't have to shovel it. I've got a very special guest for this week with, with us, uh, Michael Roken from the uh, IBM Toronto Lab. How are you doing, Mike? Very good, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's great to have you. It's great great that you're able to join us. All right, let's move along, get the housekeeping out of the way so we can get on to the good stuff. So there we go. Uh, there's our social media page, as always, uh, on Twitter. And uh, I wasn't too good on Twitter this time. I'm afraid I uh, was suffering from the uh, post-holiday uh, getting back to work type thing, and I, I'll do better next time. Uh, <laughs> There's our uh, disclaimer. I've updated the date to 2020. Whoa. You know, in, in terms of predicting uh, things for this year, I feel I have 2020 vision. Ha, ha, ha. Yes, I'm so funny. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, we got a joker in the audience. My stuff, the quick announcements, and we'll do our polls, and then we'll turn things over to uh, Michael. So there's our uh, upcoming schedule. I don't have topics and uh a, a full title for, for next month from Dale McInnes, but certainly uh, he's. we've discussed it. He wants to present alternatives for DB2 resiliency, which is going to be cool. He's going to give you the, the uh, pros and cons of various ways of making sure that DB2 stays up. And uh, that, that is, as always, uh, Dale is the man to talk to on that stuff. And Toby Haynes will be uh, talking about pure scale stuff. Curry, Romanoff will be doing a presentation on uh, the uh, internals of DB2, as she always does. So in uh, future directions, we'd like to hear from Carrie because she's the uh, DB2 main chief architect. And on the on the Z side, at the end of the month, we have Craig Mullins, who is going to be talking about coding DB2 for application performance by the book, because Craig has a new book out. And we like to uh, see Craig write books because his books are big, thick, and very useful. Uh, there's going to be a show on February 21st. I have to uh, arrange that yet. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I got some feelers out for speakers. I'm just waiting to hear back. So, uh, March 20th, April 17th is the cross-platform show all about IDUG. And uh, we'll have representatives of the uh, this year's conference planning committee telling you how great the conference is going to be in the first week of June in Dallas. And in uh, May, we've got Mariella Wyrock an IBM Distinguished Engineer, who has always done a fantastic job for us in the past, and we're excited that Mariella is joining us again. Uh, as always, there's an online demo of the uh, DBI tool set. And we like to promote uh, DBI software because they're our founding sponsor of the DB2 Night Show, and uh, if you're interested in DB2 LUW, you want to watch that demo, and they'll give you, a, I believe, a free Starbucks card if you do. Okay. Um, also, another shameless plug for myself. I'm teaching a class for Themis on uh, DB2 LUW database administration at the end of February. And uh, more inf information on that class is available at themisinc.com. You can see the full uh, agenda, etc. Also, our winner last month was David McCoy of Prudential. A gift card from Amazon has been sent off to David. And here are our sponsors, as always, DBI and yours, yours truly. Now we're into the doing the polls. So let me get the first poll up. And uh, the standard question here, which, uh, which DB2 LUW version are you running? And I, don't, I probably should have 11.5 in there, too. I meant to put it in. It's always amazing when I can leave out of a good poll. You're leaving out all the good stuff, Martin. Oh, I know, but uh, we've got some customers on 11.5. Uh, I keep I I miss that, but you notice too that uh, everybody in the audience is running 11 at least 11.1, and that's great news. And there we can share that result there. Uh, 
Got some people on 10.5, but nobody on the old stuff. That's great news. Let's carry on and do the next one. Uh, which commercial DBMSs do you run besides DB2 LUW? Uh, this should be uh, choose more than one just to see what people are running. People just a little bit more time to vote here. And, uh, close that off and share that. We've got the collector series in, in available there. And uh, hide that. And the next one. Are you using any open source DB messages? Every now and then we run into people. It looks like I made a mistake on this. It's only allowing one answer. So choose your most favorite. <laughs> kind of funny with the uh, open source community and uh, uh, eventually uh, or occasionally I see some people I recognize their names working with these other vendors besides DB2 now and it's, it's always interesting to see that. Okay, we'll close that off. A lot of people have voted there. Thank you. And we'll share the results. And uh, here we have Mongo, MySQL, and PostSQL. SQL. I had never, before putting this poll together, uh, being asked to uh, include MariaDB and Redis, I had never heard of them because I'm more of a DB2 guy. And it looks like from an audience point of view, maybe you haven't heard of them either. So let's close that off. And uh, now we should be back to seeing my screen. With that, I will move along, and I'm ready to turn things over to you, Michael. Great. The presenter, you should have a thing there now. There we go. I click the magic button. And I, and I see your screen. And all of okay, perfect. Work. Okay, great. Okay, I'll be monitoring okay. the question and answer uh, uh, tool. If people have any uh, thoughts or questions, uh, just type them in there, and I'll interrupt uh, Michael and uh, get your questions answered for you. All right. Uh, okay. In the meantime, I'll mute myself to uh, avoid any uh, background noise. All right, great. All right, thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, like I said, thank you very much for having me. And uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, calling in from wherever to uh, join in and, and hear about uh, DB2 Advanced Log Space Management. Um, it's a new feature that uh, we worked on here in the lab that came out in 11.5 GA. I think it was like around May, uh, May, June last year. A lot of hard work has been put into it, so I'd love uh, talking about it as much as I can. So again, thank you very much for having me. So a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Michael Roken. I am a developer here at the IBM Toronto Lab. I've been working here for, since uh, 2000. I, uh, I joined uh, the, the, pretty much the backup and restore team. I've been working there you know, until PureScale. And then we worked on PureScale maybe about 12 years ago. Uh, I moved into more general recovery, crash recovery, log uh, management, uh, transaction management, um, and you know, things like that. And I've been working there ever since, dabbled in a bit of HDR. So I've been a little bit everywhere in the recovery space and availability space. So that's uh, that's a little bit about me. So we'll dive right in. It works. There we go. All right. So today we're going to be talking about, uh, like I said, advanced log space management. Um, I kind of discussed this like a, I, I kind of explain it like a journey. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about what uh, what's out there today from a log space management perspective. We talk a little bit about basics so that you get a, a basic fundamental understanding of what's there today. And then, like I said, it's like a journey. So we'll kind of show you as we evolve from what we were to what we're trying to become and how we've kind of been making that journey from, you know, back in the day to what we've done recently to what we're doing right now. So please bear with me as we go through, and hopefully you can see, you know, where we're going is, is something that's to be very optimistic about, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about and touch upon all those good things. In particular about uh, log space management, like I said, we're going to be talking about some of the things that we've done today and what are the challenges to our customers. Then we'll talk about what advanced log space management is. So what's so advanced about it, you know? We like to throw around a lot of buzzwords, so advanced, but we'll, uh, we'll try to dig a little bit deeper into that and uh, show you what that all means and how it can fit into your organization and hopefully uh, be a benefit to you. 
We'll also talk a little bit about some of the monitoring and problem analysis about the feature itself. Uh, we'll get into more details on what that all means. And then lastly, like I said, it's a journey. So we'll be talking a little bit about what's, uh, what's next down the road in, in the releases and deliverables uh, to come. So hopefully you can stick with us and, uh, and join us on this journey. So first off here, uh, I just want to throw out the safe harbor statement. In most cases, I don't really care too much about this, but because what I'm going to be talking about right now is still in development, um, the feature itself is in 11.5 and is tech preview, so a lot of the things that we're doing right now may change by the time it actually makes market. So please keep that in mind. I do kind of uh, bring that up or disclaim that as I talk about a particular slide, but you know some of the things may change as we go forward, so keep that in mind. So like I said, the agenda will give a bit of a refresher on some of the basics. Uh, then we'll jump into log management in general, what we've done in the last couple of releases, 11.1 and 11.5, and to kind of get us into today's space, which is log space management. And we'll go over an overview of what the solution is, and then like I said, how we monitor and ana uh, analyze these things. I hopefully do have a bit of time for a demo at the end, a quick demo just to kind of show you how it all fits together. And then we'll wrap it up with just letting you know, you know, like I said, it's tech preview. So wrapping up and letting you know what is coming down the, uh, down the future road. So let's start up with a bit of a refresher. Uh, we'll just talk about logging types. So pretty much I generalize DB2 of, as having two particular logging types, one called circular and one called recoverable. Um, like the pictures uh, show here, circular logging, you pretty much start at log file zero. And as you create workload, you just keep going in a circle over and over and over again. Pretty much you overwrite old data and uh, it kind of limits you in terms of your point in time recovery. So circular itself is the default for most new for all new databases. Um, like I said, the log data is overwritten as you create new stuff. Uh, we do support crash recovery. So what that means is if you're starting to write open transaction workload in log file zero, uh, we can't overwrite it until it actually gets committed or rolled back. So there is a little bit of a blocker there. But if that workload constantly commits, we will just circularly overwrite. And like I said, because of that, you can't have point in time recovery, which means no online table space level backup and no roll forward support, only crash recovery support. So then we move into our recoverable uh, configuration. That is pretty much uh, defined as log retain or archiving. Log retain pretty much means, you know, first of all, recoverable in general means we do not overwrite log data. We keep, uh, we keep the, the data historically. Log retain pretty much means that you'll see the log files from log file zero onto eternity or infinite, you know, whatever. So as you keep writing new log data, we won't be overwriting the old log data. So you'll always have your logs available with, you know, as far back as you want, as long as you don't delete them. Archiving is a little bit different in that, you know, we kind of hold you to a certain space uh, configuration. So as a certain level or range of log files are no longer needed, we archive those to a, a third party location, be it a vendor or on disk, and uh, we just keep on going. It's the same, we don't overwrite data, but we pretty much just reuse the files once the, uh, the older data has been archived. So the good part is, you know, we, we never reuse, we never overwrite log data. Uh, we keep the files in the active path as long as we need, but the key thing is we support crash recovery, and because we don't overwrite data, we support online uh, operations and online backup, table space recovery, and mainly, roll for it to point in time. So you can roll for it to end the backup, you can roll for it to some time, whatever you like, and you can obviously roll for it to end of logs. It gives you that granularity using recoverable logging. Logging, so if you look at this right now, this is pretty much all the configuration parameters that are available to uh, DB2 and log space management. The fact that we have so many of these, which is like a high proportion of the total DB config parameters available to you, shows you the importance of log space management to your database. A well-tuned log space management gives you a well-tuned database. Your workloads are working well. You have good crash recovery times, um, and you have good log space management in terms of space management. So having these well-tuned is always a, a task and is always something that uh, DBAs are trying to do. And uh, us at DB2 are trying to find ways to make that always easier for you. Um, so that's always an ongoing thing. Um, things with the stars next to them, uh, the config parts with the stars have been uh, allowed to be configured online. All the other ones do require a database bounce, unfortunately. So the couple that I just want to draw your attention to for this feature is obviously the ones underneath the log space column. So we're talking about log primary, log second, log file size. 
And also here, something that we've added in 11.5, but we're just not utilizing yet, which is log disk cap. So this is something that we're going to be working on in the future, which will allow you to pretty much say, hey, DB2, I have X amount of this space available for you. You go figure out what's the best way of managing my logs for you. So this will allow us to deal with the, very, the various types of log files that we have in DB2. For example, active files, retrieve files, and what you're going to hear about in a little bit, extraction files. So that puts it all in an autonomic, automatic sort of way and allows DB2 to figure out what's the best for you. Um, as well as in the transactional space, so things like max log, num log, span. Um, some of you might be using that when you're dealing with infinite logging, which we'll touch upon in a little bit. But these particular parameters will need a little bit of uh, rework um, or revisiting when it comes time to dealing with advanced log space management. But we will talk about that in a little bit. So we'll move on from this slide. So first off, what is, you know, we talked about the different logging types. We talked about, you know, all the configuration parameters. The next thing that happens frequently is if you're not properly configured is you hit something called transaction log full. So you do your workload and, you know, and then eventually you try to do a, you know, an insert or whatnot and a message comes back saying, hey, transaction log full. And you're like, what just happened? All right. So we'll spend the next couple of slides explaining this. But pretty much the background on transaction log full is, first of all, your log space is based on a maximum amount. And that maximum amount is based on the configuration parameters, log primary plus log secondary times your log file size. That combined, that formula gives you a total disk space that DB2 will utilize for your transaction uh, logging. When you first activate the database, there's a fixed amount that we will be always pre-allocating, and that's based on log primary times log file size. So when the database first activates, it may not, it may not be fully allocated right at the get-go, but give it a few seconds or minutes, you will see slowly as your log primary gets fully allocated um, completely. And at that point, that is the, what we call the fixed space. And we will always make sure that that space is available. Now using log secondary is usually put into place when you might have spikes in workload or you just didn't get your, your tuning properly for the types of workloads that are on the system. So what happens is log primary we allocate up front all the time, but log secondary is like considered your on-demand logs. So if you have a spike in the system that needs a little bit more space and you have a log second um, configured, we will dynamically allocate these log files to ensure that you don't get transaction log full, but we will do that up to the max amount that you specify. Now the good news is log secondary is a dynamic uh, configuration parameter. So if you do find that you even have that configuration incorrectly configured, you can always dynamically increase that to avoid the transaction log full problem. So that's something to to keep in mind as well. So that's our log, uh, log configuration of disk space. The other concepts that are important in terms of transaction log full are two concepts called LOTRAN and MINBUF. So I don't know if we externally discuss these two concepts very readily, but internally it's something that we talk about a lot. And LOTRAN really represents the first lowest log record belonging to the oldest open transaction. And MinBuff belongs to the log record of the oldest or minimum dirty page in the buffer pool. Based on those two values, usually or always our crash recovery and roll forward is always based on those values. So if your low trend is, you know, if your oldest transaction is staying open for a while and we need to create new log space, well, there's a problem because we can't go over what you configured because we can't overwrite what you've already, you know, is still in flight. And same goes with MinBuff. If we haven't flushed the page yet to disk, we can't really get rid of any of the files because we're going to need things for recovery purposes. So those two values are re really important. So what happens is DB2 saves, like I mentioned, DB2 saves the log files in the active log path based on the minimum of low trend and min buff. And the log file that that value sits in is what we call head extent. And that is used primarily for rollback uh, and crash recovery reasons. That's why we save that value. Um, transaction log full pretty much happens. I have a bit of a diagram here, but trans transaction log full happens when DB2 needs to create a new log file above your log primary and log second, but it can't because of low trend and minbuff not moving up. So if you see here in the diagram, we have log files zero through seven. We have low trend sitting in zero, minbuff sitting in four. We have an primary log space of eight and no log secondary. We're keeping it simple for the illustration here. But head extent would be the minimum of the two. So that's why head extent is pointing to zero. 
So what happens now is you're exhausting your log space here. You're writing all the way up to the very end. And now all of a sudden you need to create more log space because you need to create, you know, write more log records for the transactions going on. Normally what would happen is we would try to, you know, create a log file eight, but we cannot because you told us we can't create over eight files. And because your low trend is stuck way back, we're going to fail the operation with a transaction log full. So that's pretty much the picture of what a transaction log full situation is. So one thing that we did over the years, and I, I don't recall at what point this came in, um, it's been around a while, maybe almost as long as me, uh, but pretty much we introduced something called infinite logging. And so one way to avoid transaction log full is by setting uh, your log second to minus one, and you can do this dynamically like I mentioned before. And so what happens is you go into something called infinite logging. Infinite logging now does not really care about the rules that I talked about in the previous slides. So we try to keep you know, your log primary uh, log files on disk. But if the oldest workload is in a log file that is, you know, when we need to create a new log file, if the oldest workload is in your oldest log file, it's okay. We will get rid of that file for you and allow ourselves to create a new log file. So pretty much what it says is head extent, the file that, you know, that we call head extent, it's not necessarily guaranteed to be in the active log space anymore. So we'll talk about the pros and cons in a second, but pretty much what that means is we just keep enough log files on disk based on your configuration. And the whole point of keeping the log files on disk is really for rollback purposes or crash recovery purposes. So what happens is, you know, if, if, if the log file like head extent is no longer in your active log space and you have to do a rollback or a crash recovery, well, our only other option is to actually do a retrieve and we'll have to bring that file back down. So what happens in a lot of cases is that's a major performance point for a lot of people and why there's a lot of negativity around infinite logging is because of those sudden and random retrieves that make it very difficult for uh, a customer or DBA to control because it's all done underneath the covers through DB2. One thing that we have done to kind of alleviate those problems is we have created two uh, configuration parameters called numlog span and max log. So max log is the number of log files that one con transaction can Sorry, yeah, numlog is the number of log files that one transaction can span, while maxlog is a percentage of the primary log space one transaction can consume. So it's a mechanism for you to pretty much keep in check rogue transactions. So if there's a transaction that's sitting there too long uh, and it spans multiple files, what will happen is we kind of say, sorry, you can't do anything anymore, and we do sort of a rollback situation. And it forces it to roll back and alleviate the uh, concern of that rogue transaction. Another thing we do to sort of help alleviate the performance problem, like I said, head extent may not be in your active path anymore, is we have something called the cached log space, as you can see in the diagram below. So if we started our workload in zero and head extent is based in zero because low trend is sitting there, at some point as we created, we needed new log files, normally we would have said, hey, log file zero, we archived you, we don't need you anymore here locally. But what we do is because we know we might need it for rollback purposes, we keep a small amount of log files local on top of your active log space. So although here in the diagram you have a log primary set to six, you may see up to an additional eight files sitting in your log space because we just cache at most eight files for you know, rollback crash recovery purposes. But if I exceed my, my log primary of six, I will be able to create that log 16 and number 10 will just disappear and uh, there's no problems creating files and infinite logging avoids our transaction log full problem. But with the side effects of the performance issues that I illustrated. The other side effect of infinite logging is online backup. So if you have that row, if you don't have max log and num log span set, you could have a rogue transaction that causes you to have hundreds and hundreds of log files um, necessary for your rollback or crash recovery. So what that means is if you're doing online backup with by default includes log files, you're obviously going to have to include those active log files. So what happens is if those files aren't local, we have to retrieve them. What does that mean? Well, increased backup image size, longer running backups because I have to retrieve the files and put many more backup, uh, many more log files into the backup image. And so like I said already, we do cache some of the files to help mitigate some of these retrieve problems, but it's not a perfect solution. Um, but that's infinite logging, and it does have its benefits to some workloads. 
So that was the first step sort of of log management basics. Um, I'm going to kind of move now into some of the, you know, the next step of the journey, which is what are we doing in 11, what have we done in 11.1 and 11.5 to help alleviate some of these log space management issues? So the first thing, I'm not going to go into great detail. Um, you will see some of these things on, on my blog, which there's a link at it at the end where I do talk about new features uh, when they are available. But starting in 11.1, .1, we did make um, log space, or, you know, log allocation, uh, pre-allocation of files much quicker. So like I said, when you have a log primary set up to, let's say, 100, and you only have like a, a couple of files allocated, let's say you change your log primary, when you first connect to the system, we will asynchronously create up to those 100 log primary files. Well, with, log, with fast pre-allocation, um, those log files will be created a lot quicker, um, especially if you're using larger log file sizes. Um, you will see a, a bit of an improvement in that. And that's good because what happens is if you're aware of our EDUs, our, our agents or threads that DB2 uses, log pre-allocation is done by DB2 logger R which is also the same EDU or agent or thread that does your, you know, reading for rollback purposes. So if that thread is busy pre-allocating log files, then obviously he's not fast enough to supply you the log data you need for rollback purposes. So anything we can do to make that faster is a plus. So that registry variable is available. It's not on by default. We are looking at that, but right now you can turn that on in your own environments. And there are some limitations, so I do say read up on it based on the file systems that you're using, but that's available to help uh, you know, your log uh, pre-allocation. Another thing we added in 11.1 was log compression on uh, power, AIX Power 7 and 8 machines using the NX842 module. Like I said, it's AIX only, but pretty much that allows us to do compressed uh, archiving of our log files, so that helps save on space. In mod 1 of 11.1, what we did was, you know, the trans full problem, well, you know, one thing is give us more space. So one solution is if you have lots of disk space, that's one way of solving it. So what we did is we increased our log file size up to 64 gigs. So in mod one, our new theoretical limit is up to 16 terabytes of active log space. So that's, that's there for your, your use. The next thing we did in mod three, again, is in the archiving space, which is for our customers that are using TSM or vendor archiving methods, um, there were problems that sometimes those archives could be hanging because for whatever reason there's uh, storage problems on the vendor. So what happens is we're communicating with the vendor, but we don't get a response back. And so DB2 then looks like it's hanging. Archives aren't working. You back up. Eventually you get disk pressure on your active log space because we can't get rid of the files. Even your deactivates could potentially hang because we're waiting for those archives to take place. So we introduced a timeout mechanism. It's a DB config parm log arc opt one and two, which already existed, but a new option that you can specify and allows you to specify that timeout only on Unix environments due to our infrastructure of how our vendor, fence vendor process is set up, but it allows you to timeout and this way you can get around those, uh, those pretty much TSM uh, hanging issues. In mod four, we did even more performance improvement -ish, uh, 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 solutions. One of it, which is on the Unix uh, system, um, databases that are using mirrored uh, logging. So what we did in the old day was when we did, uh, you know, dual writes to the primary pass and the mirror pass, we would do that in a serial fashion. So that proved to be a little bit, obviously, uh, you know, room for improvement. So what we did is we created an async procedure that allows us to do the mirror write first or queue it up for an async write. Then we do the primary write, and then we come back and say, hey, mirror write, are you done? That asynchronous allows us to do two IOs nearly at the same time and improves the performance for those using mirrored logging. As well, we improved rollback performance. How we did that was by introducing buffered IO when reading our transaction log data. So what was odd is if you've noticed, if you've looked at our file, active file system, when we deal with log files, we create our log primary. We keep those log files open through file handles. But what happens is you're only usually writing to the back half of those files but we keep them always open for reading purposes. What we do at read to, uh, write time is you want to be, you know, when you're writing to the log files, you want to have good performance. When you read from the log files, you want to have good performance, but we optimize ourselves for writing. So even though we were done writing to a log file, even though we had the file handle still open, it was still opened in, you know, optimized for writing. And so what that meant is when we had to do rollback and we wanted to read from that file, well, we saw performance problems there because we weren't optimized using buffered I.O. 
So what we did is we now close off those file handles and reopen them once we're done writing to a file. So those older files are opened in, in, in buffered mode, which now means when we do rollback, we can read the data much quicker by using the file system caching uh, infrastructure. And we have seen an internal testing about a three times improvement in certain rollback scenarios. Now that is based on layout of log records, but like I said, we have seen such uh, benchmarks in our own testing. So that was what's in 11.1. So now we move to our latest release, which is 11.5, that I believe we shipped in uh, about May last year. Um, and what we did is we did a lot of changing of default behavior. So in 11.1, we, we came out with a lot of things in mod packs, which we didn't want to change the behavior on automatically. So what we did is we used the new version here to give us the opportunity to change some of those defaults. So the, the parallel improvements for mirrored logging, that's now on by default. Your better rollback performance due to Pufford I.O., that's now on by default. So you're going to get those straight out of the box. A couple other things we introduced for logging environments is a new registry variable for HEDR users, which pretty much controls what the standby does with log files based on what the primary has archived or not. So what this registry variable does here, it controls whether the standby will keep log files when corresponding log files on the primary are not archived. So what this allows us to do is, you know, if, if we have to hold all these log files on the standby, that gets you into disk space. Now through this registry variable, you can alleviate some of that disk space pressure by saying, hey, if the primary hasn't archived it, get rid of the file here on the standby. I'll figure it out and re-ask for it from the primary when I need it. It's a disk, span disk space management tool. It's not something you may want to always use, but we've had customers hit by this, and this helps them alleviate problems so they can get through the issues and then go after the root cause of why there might be too many log files being cached on the standby. Another thing we did, like I talked about in 11.1, we added uh, the ability to, you know, bigger log file size, which means you had more active log space capability. In a precursor to advanced log space management, we now no longer have a limit to the number of log files we, have to, we can manage. So what happened beforehand was we have a log control file called the LFH that sits in the database directory. In there, there was a hard limit array that said you can only have 256 log files. So that was limited. So beforehand, you could have 256 64 gig log files, but it limited that you could not have any more log files than that. 64 gig is a little big, so maybe you want smaller, but you couldn't have more of those. We've alleviated that now by creating up to 4K worth of log files, both for log primary and log secondary, so a combined 8K. That's just the limit that we introduced. Technically, there is no real theoretical limit, but we did introduce something because by going into the higher number of log files, you could potentially exhaust the file system's uh, number of file handles open. So we brought it into a reasonable, I'm quoting that, a reasonable amount that we think that most customers probably wouldn't use more than that just so that you have the ability to get more log files out of it. This is only used for recoverable databases though, not for circular. And pretty much what this now allows you, like I said beforehand in 11.1, we were up to you know, 16 terabytes, circular is still like that. But now for recoverable database, you can have up to 512 terabyte of active log space. Now you might say, wow, that's a lot. But at the end, we are not the limiting factor. We've made it available if that is something that is needed to you. You probably want something a, a less than that. But again, it could be more than what we had before, and it's better tuned based on the flexibility of how you want to configure primary, secondary, and log file size. So another thing that we add in the 11.5, uh, I won't go into great detail. I have a small slide about this in a second, but it's something called reduced logging. So reduced logging um, in the warehouse space, you'll probably see this a lot more or, or heard about this a lot more for our warehouse uh, product lines. Uh, but what we have done from that, so our cloud, for example, is we've taken on a reduced unlog logging feature, and that's now on by default in 11.5, and that's available for everyone. So what that has done, we've noticed, is it's cut log space requirements in half. So again, another way to alleviate your log space. Reduce uh, redo logging is something that's still only available in our warehouse installations, and we found with that, that's caused us to do 95% less logging. It's sort of like a not logged initially, and like I said, I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail in a, in a split second. And lastly, the thing that we're all here to talk about today is advanced, like, advanced log space management. That's our tech preview, uh, not for production use, but that's, again, going after reducing the transaction log full problem. 
So reduced logging. Uh, again, I won't go into great detail, but pretty much from the slide here, it only applies to our columnar organized tables, so blue environments. It applies itself to bulk operations like upgrade and ingest, um, which drives inserts internally. So reduced undo logging, like I said, is on by default. What it really does is it avoids the need to reserve log space. So what happens in a normal world is, um, take away infinite logging, is when you write a log record, we always have to, have to make sure we have the space to undo that log record. Um, so what that means is you've got your actual physical space of the log record you want to write, so let's say the normal log record, but then you have an additional space for a uh, reserve space for if you have to roll that log record back in the near future. So let's call it, for the case of example, double the space for every log record. So with this feature, what it does is it cuts down that requirement to have the reserved space. So from that, we found a substantial improvement, and obviously that cuts down on the log space requirement. Reduced redo logging like I said, is only available in the warehouse. And it pretty much, it, it logs metadata, metadata changes only, but it skips a lot of the page content. So it's similar to not logged initially, but improve, with improved recoverability and concurrency controls. So if you're using not logged initially and you've got to do a roll forward through it, we, in most cases, if not all, we have to put those tables uh, bad and you lose the data because you didn't log it. But with reduced logging, it does support um, online backup and there's a capability and a technology built so that it can support at least recovery to end of backup. Again, this is only in the warehouse world. Um, it does support rollback crash recovery, and like I said, and re roll for recovery to only end of backup. Point in time, end of logs past the backup image is not supported, but because of our warehouse um, contracts in terms of what we offer as a recoverability solution, um, there is no point in time in that world. So there is only end of backup support. So that's why it is uh, good for those environments. It is something that we're talking about bringing into the, the, the on-prem and other flavors of our, our product lines, but we would have to solve what to do for the point in time recovery. But again, in the warehouse world, be aware that this is available and another way to cut down on your log space consumption. All right. So this is pretty much our, that was our refresher on what, uh, you know, what we, you know, log space management, what we've done to kind of tackle some of the problems over the years. We're now going to dig deeper into advanced log space management itself, and we're going to go through the overview of the solution and all the different things that go with it. So this is going to be the guts of the presentation. So Martin, I don't know if you wanted to take a quick moment to say a few words, or I can carry on, whichever you prefer. Oh, well, let me clear that out of the way here. Um, I just need to take a short commercial break on behalf of our our sponsor, DBI, and uh, let me uh, bring that up right now. Just need to find find the right button here. Here we are, and there's my screen. And uh, what we'll do is just uh, we've got a, a couple of screens of a new version of of uh, DBI tools that are coming out. I'll just uh, show them to you. There's the uh, main menu. It's basically showing which repositories, databases, instances. You can have multiple repositories and monitor various databases and instances across multiple servers. And the uh, parts of that which are most of interest to DBAs are uh, dealing with service levels and where you have problems. Uh, it shows you the information both in, in terms of a uh, various meters, various bar graphs that, that show performance. And, uh, who's using the most memory, where you uh, might have bottlenecks in read and write times and CPU time and that sort of thing. Moving on to the next slide, there's uh, a, a bunch of time graphs which show memory usage, memory free, and uh, also how, how the system is doing in terms of uh, CPU time and that sort of thing. It's quite possible to take any of these uh, time graphs and do time slicing and get right down to where a problem was. For example, if I was interested in the peak, I, would, I could look at one of those. The other thing as well is that DBI is quite doing as you uh, break that out and look at one of these problems. It also tells you if there's been any system changes that uh, either improved or worsened uh, uh, your performance. For example, if I change this, uh, a database parameter and things get worse, well, I can look at that parameter and perhaps consider changing it back or changing it to a different value that doesn't cause a problem. We also, there's an awful lot of information on 
service level agreements and whether or not SLAs have been met in, in, uh, in terms of uh, the promises you've made to customers. One of the things, of course, with performance is not only finding problems, but also uh, being able to demonstrate that you're uh, meeting uh, your delivery targets. And DVI is very big on being able to help you with that. So with that, I will turn things back to you, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for that short break. And you should have the pop-up on your screen now. Oh, perfect. Yep. See it? Oh, let me just click the magic button again. And hopefully we're back on? Yes. Sir. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. All right. So going into now the, uh, the guts of the presentation, uh, we're going to be talking now primarily about log space management and, you know, what the issues are, what, uh, you know, what we, what we did, what we're going to do, and uh, all the other fun stuff to kind of give you a taste of what we have in GA for you to play around with. And I do recommend highly that you go play around with the feature because we love feedback. It's still in development right now, so you know we have a better chance of uh, making some tweaks and, and whatnot before the full thing comes out for support. So definitely play around with that. You learn five, get your hands on uh, you know the developer edition and whatnot. Um, but let's uh, let's jump in. So advanced log space management. What's the problem in use case? So you know normally when I present this in 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 in, in front of a crowd, I like to poll the audience. Um, you know how many people have been bit by the transaction log full problem because it. It's something that I'd like to see if you know if you actually have this problem, and in most cases, you know, 95% of the room throws up the hands, and 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 from our standpoint, that is the number one complaint that we get from a lot of big customers over the years. In a lot of situations, you know, it, it's still a problem for many. A lot of people have kind of taken the things that I've talked about in the previous slides and kind of tuned it to avoid the situation, but it's a lot of management. Like people still have to watch it to make sure that they don't get bit by it because if workloads change, whatever you configured in the past may need to be retuned. So that is always a problem where you have to keep watching your tuning uh, because your workloads change over time. So anyhow, our biggest problem that we get from customers is the transaction log full problem. So that's why it is a big investment for us because obviously it makes our customers happy, less phone calls, everyone's happy. So what we're going though for is we can't you know, especially out of the box, advanced log space management won't be a solution that solves everybody's problems. We're going after a very core use case scenario, which is quick, short running transactions running in parallel with long running transactions. But those long running transactions log very little. So for example, loads, create indexes. What happens is a lot of those transactions take a very long time but they don't actually log that much or they don't log a lot to start with. And what happens is if you're running in a sort of OLTP environment where you have lots of quick running transactions doing insert, update, deletes, and you have one of these long running guys running in parallel, well, that could give you pushback on your quick running transactions because the long running guy will be holding up low tran and then your quick running guy cannot create new log, fi new log files to hold the new data and therefore you get your transaction log full problem. So the big thing to keep in mind through all of this is we're trying to solve quick running transactions running in parallel with long running, low logging environments. Okay, that's what we're going after. So for example, the long running monster transaction, we call it monster in-house, which is let's say that one transaction that is logging everything or like 95% of the log space is consumed by this monster transaction which we may see during batch jobs, you won't see much benefit from this feature because this fits the model of a high logging rate um, log volume issue. In that situation, you will still see your transaction log full problem. In an environment where you have monster transactions, you probably would want to look at something like reduced logging, which I talked about before, especially in the warehouse space where monsters exist uh, more frequently than the uh, traditional OLTP environment, that's sort of what you would want to go there. So this is a logging volume issue, and that's what reduced logging is going after. Where for us, where we have the, 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 the low logging rate environment, that's something that advanced log space management is going to excel in, or we hope will excel in. So the first objective of advanced, space log, uh, advanced log space management is, or let's, I'm going to short form it, ALSM, is we want to avoid log full. That's the whole point of why you want to use the feature. 
And at the same time, we want to provide monitoring tools to you to make sure that in doing so, we don't take up too much disk space. You'll see what I mean by that in a, in a few minutes, but pretty much we want to make sure no log full, no impact to workload, no impact to disk space consumption, or very little. That's what our first objective is. Objective is. Our future objective is to make log space management really advanced or autonomic, which means, you know, today we have fixed log space. We want DB2 to move towards an autonomic manner. Like I was saying before with the, you know, I mentioned the, a new a config farm coming up called log disk cap. We want you to just tell us this is as much disk space we give in DB, DB2. You go figure out what's best for us. That's what we're trying to move towards. It's not going to happen overnight. It may not even happen in the next year or two, but that is definitely something that we're looking at to evolve DB2 into in the, in the, in the future. So what is the solution? All right. The solution is pretty much we have our active log files. As you can see here in the diagram, zero, you know, zero, one, two, three, four. We're currently writing to four. And what's going to happen is if I don't have extraction, uh, you know, advanced log space management is pretty much going to do something called extraction. And what that means is if I realize that I'm getting pressured on my active log space, I'm going to go and look at the oldest log files and see what transaction data is open or in flight. And I'm going to extract out only the things I need. And so what that means is once I've done, you know, archiving that file and extracting only the in-flight data, that file can now disappear. And so what that means is I get left with these smaller files called extraction log files. I'll go into detail in a second what they are. And the active file can now be, you know, it's been archived already, but the active file can be reused for new log data. So what that means is if you have an active log file of a size X, your extraction log files will be a much smaller percentage of that X. So that allows us to only keep what's important while moving off the, the big chunk of the data that's not needed for anything anymore, at least from a rollback, currently committed crash recovery perspective. So we're going to be extracting long running <clears throat> active transactions into these separate files. And pretty much once the file is closed and archived, you know, we, we can extract from it and you're going to avoid transaction log flow because of it. So the new files that you will see in replace of the traditional S file or active file is something called extraction log files or what we call fancy X file, you know? So what we have here are three uh, or two file types or three file types, actually, you won't see the one that often, but we have a meta file, a temp file and a TID file. So what that means is the TID file will be, so for every open transaction that you have from log file zero, you will see a TID extraction file and it'll be labeled after the trans TID is a transaction ID. It'll be labeled after that transaction ID. And so like you see here in the example, you know, TID1, TID2, those are the two transaction uh, log files for TID1 and TID2. Then what you'll see is a meta file. The meta file for file zero will hold things for recovery purposes. So there's, there's pieces of information in there that we need for crash recovery, like the, uh, the, the, what we call the log file header. Um, that has a lot of information of what's in the log file. So although we only have a subset of the data in the extraction files, we may, we may need to know what's all in the extraction files for recovery purposes. So that will be held in the meta. The temp file is just a meta, dot, meta file that's being currently extracted from. So that's going to be short lived. And eventually when we're done extracting from the file, that temp turns into a meta file. So those are the new files that you're going to see in the system. So pretty much it's a very simple concept. If, the, if, the, we, if we need that log file, we extract data out of it, and that's all we keep, and everything else goes away. Simple concept. But it comes with a lot of complications or things that we need to look at. Obviously, because we have new log file types, we need to build that into our different consumers, be it crash recovery, rollback, currently committed, backup. We have to build a new way of, of reading these types of files. So that's where a lot of our work and emphasis is on right now. So the big thing is in order to get uh, ALSM working and extraction, so I may now talk about extraction from now on because that is the first core feature of ALSM, you need to have an archive uh, enabled database. So if you have archiving enabled, extraction will be uh, uh, possible and you will start to see these uh, uh, improvements and these new log files uh, show up in your, your, in your log file space. Um, extraction is going to be done, so you're going to see by an e a new EDU or thread, that's, it's called the DB2 log X thread. So you'll see that now in your process model if you do a DB2 PD EDUs. What we have found that there's 
pretty much no to minimal impact of this background extraction going on. All right. So what this extraction really is underneath the covers is, like I said, this EDU is really doing, if those of you are, who are familiar with Q replication or CDC, those things use something called the DB2 read log API. Underneath the covers, we're pretty much doing the same thing. We're going to be reading the logs on a continual basis and figuring out what we need to extract from it. So obviously, if you're running that all the time, there could be some strain on the system. But because we're going under low logging volumes, we feel that we're going to find that that extraction is very minimal. And because of that, you won't see much uh, resource consumption. So that's something to keep in mind again when I talk and go forward is extraction will work best fitting the model, which is a low logging environment. So to make sure, though, that we don't extract and, and just run crazy, what we're introducing are a couple of throttling policies. Um, some of these, this is going to be ever evolving. So again, this comes back to the disclaimer, what we say now may change down the road, or I may be leaving some things out. Um, pretty much disk availability. Extraction loves disk space. So this is why this log disk cap config farm down the road will be important. But if you have enough disk space, we can extract pretty much as much as we want, and you'll see lots of rewards from this feature. But the other thing we'll keep in mind is we're not going to extract carelessly. I'm not going to extract too aggressively because if I do, I need to then extract potentially data that's going to be committed. And that's wasteful because it's overhead that I didn't need to do. So we will be putting in a, a, a threshold, if you want to call it. So for example, if we see you know, your log space available compared to free space higher than a certain percentage, we will kick in extraction at that point. Otherwise, if you stay within a certain percentage, then pretty much that's saying you're well configured for the work uh, workload that you're doing. And so what will happen is, you know, extraction will never kick in and you'll never see something, uh, you'll never see any problems on your system. The end game really is, are we producing a benefit? So if extraction can help you out, then, you know, we will extract. If there's no benefit seen, that it may be because you have a monster on the system, like we're extracting everything that's being written, that's of no benefit to anyone. Sure, you'll get log full, but that extraction will consume more resources because it's, it's reading and writing constantly. So we will find and say, hey, that's maybe not a benefit to you, so extraction will turn itself off. And what that means is the extraction process goes idle. And if it goes idle, that means you can get transaction log full. An idle, trans an idle extraction scan can happen for different reasons. Some of the obvious ones is maybe because your log archiving is not healthy. If you're going to vendor, maybe the vendor is down right now and it can't get the files off the active path. Well, we will not extract from log files that have not been archived. Why? If you have the active file and the extraction file, that's duplicating some log space. So right now, what we have implemented is a simple thing that says, if the file cannot be removed from the active file system, then I can't extract from it. So that's sort of what we have in place. Ideally, if you are using log archiving, especially to a vendor, um, you do have fail arc path set, which means if your vendor's down, you will move to the secondary location, the active files. And then once the vendor comes back again, they'll move from the fail arc path to the vendor. In doing so, that will move the file out of the active space, which will allow us to actually do extraction. So that's something to keep in mind. I talk about this in a little bit. Buffer pool flushing is slow. So the same as with archiving, if minbuff, what we talked about before, is sitting in a particular file, we will not extract from that file or above minbuff. Why? Because in a recovery world, when we do our crash recovery, our recovery model has to see every log record after minbuff. If I got to see every log record after minbuff, then me extracting every log record means I'm going to be doubling the disk space. So we feel that's not a benefit to the system. So we've implemented right now a minbuff filter to say anything less than minbuff, we will extract from. Anything above minbuff, we will not. Usually buffer pool flushing is due to a couple of config parms. Um, in the older world, that was softmax. In the newer world, that's page age, target MCR, which applies to ESE, DPF, uh, or single node, multiple node, and pure scale. And then we have something called page age target GCR, which is meant particularly for our pure scale environment. The ideal world is, you know, the defaults for these values, I believe, are now two minutes. So in, within a two minute span, we may not flush a page to disk. If your workload needs enough disk space, if your workload will fill your primary disk space or your configured disk space in those two minutes, you will have problems. 
So that's something that we're looking at right now, finding out what's a good tuning mechanism. But that's one thing if you have buffer pool flushing too slow, it will put some strain on the system and you will get transfer. So you may have to do some configuration here. Another reason why extraction is slow is, uh, sorry, extraction, it goes idle is because maybe it's slow. It could be that your log writing EDU is faster than your log uh, or extraction EDU. That could be because we're extracting too much and we just can't keep up with the writing rate. Um, so that's possible. Another could be just a general write error. I'll talk about errors in a second, but if you have a write error, including disk full, the scan will stop. So in the solution, we're extracting data. What does that mean to the consumers? So one consumer is rollback. So what we've created is pretty much a line. So this line represents left of the line has been extracted, right of the line, the data is still in the active files. So when a reader comes in and says like rollback or currently committed comes in and says, hey, I need log record at log offset X, I know to go left or right. And if it's in the retrieve, if it's in the extracted files, I'll give you the data from the extracted files. If it's in the active files, then I'll give it to you from the active files. So if there's any problems with reading from the extraction files though, be rest assured you do have a backup plan, which is always the file has been archived. So that's why we say it only works for archiving. We will retrieve that log file. So it's a bit of a pain point, but you know, file IO on the extraction files is really a worst case scenario. But we got your backs, we will go and retrieve the file so that you still will get your log data. Um, and so this pretty much applies to both rollback and currently committed scanners. <coughs> Excuse me. Crash recovery, well crash recovery is going to work in the same way. Crash recovery is going to use the extraction log files for, for both redo and undo. Um, so that will be helpful because it's going to read less. Uh, post crash recovery, we're going to pick up where we left off. So the scan will just continue. So if you have in doubt transactions or things from uh, what we call async undo or online recovery that have been deferred from crash recovery. That's not a problem. We'll know where to extract and pick up where we left off. We'll have old extraction files, new extraction files, not a problem. We honor set write suspend. So if you're suspending your write operations, then just like uh, that, we will also suspend extraction operations. And if your database is encrypted, well, so are your extraction log files. Um, the solution will also provide some monitoring. Uh, here are the monitoring functions that we've updated to give you some stats to help you see what we're doing internally to make sure that we're, we're behaving properly and meet expectations. Um, the other thing is we do have to look at, as a customer, you will have to look at max log and num log span. Um, those are for rogue transactions. So if you want rogue transaction support, you can still use these. But just keep in mind that you know max log span, max log is not a big deal, but num log span if you set that to a low enough value, that might kick in before our, our extraction threshold. So if that's the situation, then we may not extract anything because you've kicked out the transaction before we had a chance. The good news is NumLog span does not work for utility workloads like load. So if you're long running transactions a load, um, then you don't have to worry too much because it, it doesn't apply anyways. But if your long running transaction is a regular workload, then maybe you may want to look at that because that could be an example of something that's just consuming too much log space and doesn't necessarily fit the model. The last thing is with extraction enabled, should you or should you not, you know, no infinite logging versus infinite logging. The one difference is if you ha have no infinite logging enabled, transaction log full is still possible in extreme cases due to the things that I talked about in the previous slides. But if you have infinite logging set, you kind of get the best of both worlds. Transaction log full will not happen because that's the typical thing with infinite logging, but you will also not get the performance problems because we will use the extraction files for all of the other rollbacks, crash recovery and whatnot. But in extreme cases like not having enough disk space, infinite logging has a drawback, which means workloads will lag. What happens is if we don't have the disk space and you're using infinite logging, because we can't give you a trans full problem, we will spin. And that's when you have the other config problem called lo uh, block not logged or, or something like that. I forget the name, but pretty much you block based on disk full situations. So you'll have to configure there. But again, keep in mind infinite versus no infinite and the pros and cons of using that with extraction. So a couple of restrictions. Um, we don't use this in production because it's still tech preview. You enable it with a registry variable that I've listed here. Um, and then what the right now is we don't support HDR environments, mirrored logging, or pure scale environments. So right now, like I said, as tech preview, we still got to build these out. We do not plan to support circular or log retain environments, so archive logging only. 
Uh, a couple of limitations, like I said, disk space. We will consume additional disk space. How much is all dependent on your extraction rate and how well you fit the model. If we have to extract a lot, we will need a lot of disk space. If we extract not a lot, then potentially over time you will see a benefit in terms of, you know, not taking up too much disk space, but also all reaping the rewards of your quicker rollbacks and crash recoveries and not getting trans full. Over time though, extraction files will add up. So we got to keep that in mind as well. Um, online backup, right now we don't put extraction files in there. So it's similar to the infinite logging, which, may, which means we'll have to retrieve all log files. So if you have extraction on and, and head extent is way, way back, we don't have that file local anymore. We don't do anything with the extraction file. So we have to retrieve the active file longer backup times, bigger backup image sizes. So that's a limitation right now as well. We've gone under the runtime model for the tech preview. We're still looking at the operational side and building that out. Uh, crash recovery will work. It uses the, for undo phase, it uses the extraction files, but we haven't built it out in redo phase yet. That's something called selective recovery where we pick and choose log records. Uh, that's something we're working on right now. And restore and roll forward does not use extraction files. They delete everything and they retrieve everything. So that's, uh, like I said, the operational side still has some room for improvement. Okay, so that's the overview of advanced log space management um, and specifically the extraction aspect of it. Hopefully you do see the merits of how this can help your, your system not get transaction log full, but you do need to make sure you fit the model. And some of the monitoring and P, uh, PD things that I talk about now will help you understand that and, and see whether you will reap rewards from this feature. So first of all, here's some of the monitoring things. I'm not going to go into great detail on it, but here we've updated some new columns, uh, mon get transaction log. So you can see based on bytes written, uh, times and reading times, processing speeds, uh, disk full situations, a bunch of monitors that maybe over time we'll add to as we get feedback from people on what they want to see and, and know about. But this is the first set that we came up with. A couple others that are more at the unit of work level. And then we also enhanced, uh, for those that like PD command, we use it a lot in-house, so that's one reason why we did it. But the DB2 PD command, the logs option, we added two fields on um, extraction active and uh, you know what log file we're extracting at. Um, so pretty much that will help you know what the state of affairs is for extraction. The status will pretty much say active or not active. Um, and so pretty much you have active error recovery. And then the current log will tell us what log file we're actually extracting from. All right. And then what the key thing is here in this example is you see that current log to extract says 46. And you see here down below, these are the active files that we, we have open in the active log directory. If you see that as 46 and you see the current log extracting from as 46, that's an indicator that we might have a bit of problem because we're extracting from the very oldest file which means potentially new workload will want newer files. And if we can't get the extraction uh, number out of the oldest log file, we may get into a transfold situation. So I just want to point that out. I talk about that in the later slide. <coughs> Excuse me. So would the feature be beneficial? Well, three things to consider what beneficial means from our perspective is obviously, are you avoiding transaction log full? Great. Are you not consuming too much disk space? And also, if we're extracting a lot, are we taking up too much CPU? And I, is there CPU and I.O. overhead? Meaning, is there impact to your system in that the system is working more slowly? Or are your workloads not uh, going at the same rates as they were before? So that could mean that extraction is, is too, too, too heavy on the system. So for us, uh, the best, uh, uh, pretty much the best situation is all of them are properly well managed. So you avoid transaction log full by extracting very little and the extraction process in doing so has very little overhead. How do you do that? You extract very little. Again, long running, low logging volumes is the model that we're going after. So a couple of things you can do to just see if you fit the model is you can monitor what the longest running transactions are in your system and how much disk space they take up. And if you come up with uh, that ratio, uh, as I described here, A and B, you can pretty much find out whether extraction will be beneficial or not. If you have a low, uh, a low ratio of your A to B, then pretty much that means you have a low running logging environment and that suits the model very well. So I'm gonna go through a couple of these slides a little bit quickly because really they're just splashes of SQL. Uh, but please look, you know, we'll, the download will be available and I think you can, go to my, you can go to my blog as well and download the presentation and you'll get this information. So don't worry if I go too fast here. 
Um, how much disk space do I need to run optimally with the feature? Well, pretty much, it depends on the, again, the amount of data that you extract. And you're going to hear that as a common theme. Very little to extract, then potentially you can reduce your active log space a lot. So what do I mean by that is, if you have, let's say, like I said, extraction runs when we hit a threshold of use, use the free space. If you configured way too much space, potentially we never hit that threshold. You can look at some of the monitoring tools and see that. And if that's the case, you could actually reduce your active log space. And in reducing your active log space, now the threshold will maybe kick in, and now extraction will kick in. So there's something to play around with there to see if you're configured properly for your workloads and how extraction impacts that with any tuning that you do. Uh, pretty much we recommend uh, that you have an additional 20% disk space. Um, that's just a number that we came up with. Environments will probably be different, but that's something to start out of the box if you want to play with. And then based on the numbers you find, you will have to monitor to, and tune to find that right fit. So a couple of quick things, monitoring. Is the feature enabled? We, right now, uh, we turn on a registry variable and uh, you turn that on. Um, if you're not enabled, the dialogue will state the reason why. Every time we come on and the registry variable set, it'll pretty much say why. It could be because of HADR or pure scale. And also the db2pd command will list these things as not applicable so you know that you're not using advanced log space management extraction. If you are enabled, well, the PD command will display the information saying extraction is active and where we're extracting from. And there will be a diag message saying that, hey, advanced log, log extraction under ALSM has been enabled, and this is where we're extracting to. Uh, one thing you may want to find out is how efficient you are with extraction. Well, this can be based on something that we call an extraction filter rate, data analyzed versus data written. So with an SQL query like that, you can see how many ex bytes we've extracted and written to disk compared to how much we've read. Uh, remember, we read every log record um, and toss away things that are not in flight. And in this case, this scenario shows you that you have about a 3% active log data written. Uh, pretty much 3% of your date log data written to your active files has been extracted. And in our world, we call that very efficient. What constitutes extraction health? Well, obviously, no extraction, no transaction log full. You don't get transaction log full, then things are good. Having the right workload and configuration, making sure that filter rate, again, of low logging, vol uh, low logging uh, volume is, is, is running. Uh, the main cause could be, you know, you, if you have an extraction rate and it's telling you that you're extracting too much, maybe we got slow extraction. So these are things you need to look at. Archiving, you want to make sure your archiving is healthy, not sick. If you do, use fail arc path, that helps. Flushing, buffer pool flushing, you want to make sure that the config farms are set to make sure it matches your workload. And you want to make sure you don't get into disk full situations. You want to monitor that on a regular basis. Because we are creating additional files, um, there may be an additional stress on the file system. You want to make sure that we don't chew up too much. We will turn extraction off if we're taking up too much disk space, but you may just want to make sure that that is behaving properly. Um, some helpful queries, this just lists out all the uh, log file numbers and, and status of the different things like archiving and extraction state. So this is a query that you can look at while it's running on the side. Um, the next slide here talks about you know, the same sort of view from the DB2PD. I splashed a, a, a screen here, a picture here of a graph. Don't worry about the details of it, but pretty much what this analyzes is on the left is the threshold. We have an 80% threshold. So your free to available threshold is 80%, and bottom is time, and the red and the green are, are starting uncommitted workloads and, and rolling those back. As you can see, as the workload consumes up to 80% disk space, extraction kicks in, and then we start you know, uh, toggling back and forth from the 80% rule as extraction works. As soon as you commit that workload, well, that means there's nothing to extract anymore. We drop all the way back down again. And then another in-flight workload, same thing happens. And as you can see, the pattern of how extraction uh, works and makes sure that your, your consumption or your log space consumption ratio stays within that 80% rule, which is something that we have internally built right now, so that's why you see it like that. Um, what, what is the disk space consumption? Again, you might want to know, hey, am I consuming too much? So what you're going to have here is you, you know, what, we've, you know, what we've written what we're using and what was the max amount of use since the last activation, that'll help tell you how much we've been extracting and will tell you whether, oh, okay, I got a lot more in-flight uh, transaction volume than I thought. So this is one way you can take a look at that. What can transaction consumes the most disk space? 
Well, one way of doing it is a little bit of a complex query, but you can find out what transaction its application handle. And then from the application handle, you can get the transaction ID. And then the transaction ID matches to the uh, TID file, the extraction TID file. And from that, if you do an LS on, on your file directory, you can see which one is taking up a lot of disk space, how big the extraction files are, and you can map the TIDs that way to figure out which transaction is taking up a, a lot. It's another backward way, but it, it helps you kind of see it from a backwards perspective from an LS command to using the monitoring command. So that's some of the monitoring stuff. I'm going to move a bit into the P, uh, PD. I'm not going to go a great detail of it. I'm a little bit uh, over the one hour mark, so I do want to wrap this up. Uh, but I do want to mention some of the things that are coming down the road. Um, right now, we will have some formatting for PD. So if there's any problems with extraction files, we'll be able to format them for IBM service. So the DB2 FMT log command will be enhanced to, to see support. That may make it for our, our second quarter deliverable. It may not but it will come down the road in a future uh, deliverable at some point. The same goes with the DB2 check log command. We use that to check the validity and the uh, consistency of log files. We will build that out for extraction files as well, so you know you can rely on those for recovery operations. Um, the next thing is I do want to reiterate, we do have your back. So if there are corruption issues to the extraction files, we always have the active log files to draw from. So if any meta or TID file is bad, we will use those active files. If it's local, great. If it's archived, we will retrieve. Uh, pretty much, you know, it applies to in all situations for all readers. Rollback, crash recovery, roll forward, standby, online backup, currently committed. All of these at some point will be built out to read from extraction files, but if there is a problem, we will retrieve. Currently committed is a little bit more interesting. Um, in that if we have a problem, it's like, do we retrieve or not retrieve? It's like, what's faster, the lock weight or retrieving the log file? So for currently committed, we said the lock weight is probably more beneficial. So in that case, if you do have a problem with an extraction file, we will go back to the lock weight behavior and will not retrieve. But in all the other cases, we'll, we'll, we will retrieve as uh, necessary. So I'm going to go through all of these are the same. So I'm going to glance through it a little bit quickly. But the things in red, do draw. I'll draw your attention to. You know, you have the feature on, but you still have transa the transaction log full. Why? So you will see in the diag log, you know, one way is the diag log will give you a message um, saying, hey, um, a no space message. You'll see that sometimes. And then what you will see with these messages is in the surrounding areas, these dumps that will tell you that, hey, I have an archive from uh, this file 1038. I haven't extracted from 1038. Why did I hit log full? Well, the throttle reason is due to log archiving. So you go over to the PD, you look, and you see that your meth one log arc meth one is in a failure state. You haven't been archiving for a while. Extraction is still active, but we've throttled it. So in this situation, it tells you that you got log full because your archiving is sick, and we couldn't extract from the oldest file. And so you should go check into that. Uh, the next example is a disk full situation. You get, again, transaction log full. You go here, you see the diag log say throttle reason disk full. You go back and you look at the PD output and it says it's active. You see you're extracting from 1051. You see the oldest log file in the active path is 1051. So you got a disk full issue. This is a little tricky because it could be because of extracting too much or it could be because, you know, the file system isn't dedicated to DB2 and you have other files maybe writing to the file system. So if it's induced by extraction or from the outside world, you might have to do a little bit of looking into. Uh, but pretty much this is what happens in a disk full situation. Uh, another one is just a general scan error. Let's say we tried to read and there's just a, a, a programming logic error. You'll see again, tran full, you'll see that there's a scan error. You'll see the extraction status in the PD say there's an error and it'll tell you what file. Scan error is not something that you can fix. So you probably want to contact IBM support and they can help figure it out. But the good news is as soon as the oldest transaction does commit or roll back, we will self-correct the problem and extraction will continue. It just means when you have a scan error, we're stuck at that uh, log file and we can't extract anymore. But as soon as we move Lotran past that point, we can self-correct and continue extraction again. The goal is extraction is always, it's not fatal to the system, but it will always try to do the best it can. So if there is problems, it will keep retrying and eventually try to correct whatever problems it runs into. Um, the last example here is uh, you get tran full. Why? Well, here it tells you again, now the throttle reason is slow BP flushing. So in that situation, there's a couple of commands you can run to find out what the min buff LSN is. 
it can tell you through the FLSN tool what log file that's in. It tells you, and that maps up to saying that we couldn't extract from the same file. Now we know why that's the case. What is the reason? Like I talked about before, maybe a heavy workload and you're properly not configured. Maybe flushing's not properly tuned. You got a monster that's just extracting so much we can't get it manually uh, flushed to disk. You may need to do a manual flush buffer pools command. So that's something to, to think about. So I do have a demo. Uh, I don't think I'm going to get to it just because I am approaching the 75 minute mark. So I'm sorry about that. But here is the link to the demo. I do recommend that you, uh, you, know, you go to that link at your own time and download it and, and have a look at it. It's about three minutes. Um, you know, keep in mind that we're developers and not uh, video creators, uh, but it does show you all the different things that I talked about, um, and hopefully you get the idea of seeing what I've talked about in actual practice. So I just want to wrap up the last couple of slides about what we're going to do down the road. So right now, the tech preview is out there. Like I said, it's focused on runtime. We do want to go after the operational side. So like all the recoveries, so we are building out full crash recovery support for redo and undo, and we will have good performance. So like GA does not have this, but we've already internally improved the undo performance. So the next time you get your hands on the beta, you will see better undo performance. Uh, redo, we're functionally working on that right now. HEDR, well, HEDR puts a strain on the system. If your primary is running with extraction, but the problem is you're shipping those log records over the standby. The standby has to actually replay everything because that's the way, you know, that's the way the standby works. It can't selectively pick and choose log records because you're trying to recreate a second, you're trying to mirror your primary on your standby. But what can happen is we can alleviate disk space. So if we hold too many active files in place in the file system, there is a potential for us to go and extract out data that may not be necessary anymore for undue reasons. So we're going to be looking at running extraction on the standby, just like on, in runtime on the primary, by picking out open data to hopefully allow for less strain on the disk space that could happen on the standby while doing uh, extraction. So that's something in the works. Online backup support, we will look to include extraction files from when you start the backup. We'll capture a low trend min buff and what those extraction files are, and we'll stick them into the backup image and use those for uh, recovery. Um, and yeah, and, and so pretty much roll forward, we'll use those and then whatever we don't have in extraction files and we need for active files to get to the point in time, we'll start retrieving those log files. Uh, we are going to look to eventually scale out to pure scale. Uh, that's just a, an overhead that we have right now because there's a lot of uh, differences between single partition and multi partition, especially in the log space management and recovery space. So that's going to take us a little bit more time. So that's probably something that we're not aiming for second quarter. It might come, uh, a little bit later down the road. Um, same goes with mirror logging. That's going to come down the road sometime. Um, you know, how do we do that? We're going to be extracting into the primary path. Do both paths need to have extraction data? Uh, you know, that's something that we need to figure out. And then once we solve all those problems and handle as many workloads seamlessly as we would like, we will look to turn this feature on by default. It should be of no uh, negative to you, only beneficial. And the worst case scenario is you hit tran full, which would be no different than what it was before. But if you model well, you will reap the reward. So those are the things that we're looking at down the road. One last thing, so this is the last two slides, is log disk cap. I do want to mention it because I do feel strongly towards this, and I hope to see this down the road. It's defined in 11.5, but it's not yet implemented. But what it will do will allow you to specify the maximum disk space capacity you're giving DB2 to manage. This will hold ex active files, extraction files. It'll hold anything that's, you know, potentially, let's say, um, inactive, meaning, you know, we may not need the log file anymore, but maybe you have a read log scan going on. So that read log scan needs those log records to be able to send them to your replication product. So think of them as cached files. So they're not there for active reading, but they're there for optimization of other readers on the system. So we could keep those around rather than having to retrieve those for scanners like that. And then obviously retrieve log files. Ideally, we recommend an overflow log path so you don't have this issue. But if you don't and you retrieve to the active sub, the subder under the active log path, that takes up this space. So we would have to manage that as well. And between all of those log file types, we will take care of what is most beneficial to the system at the current moment. And that's the point of log disk cap. 
Um, we would probably use log primary and log secondary only as a guidance. We'll probably keep the log file size, but we will figure out how many active files we need to pre-allocate to satisfy log writing and how many log files we need to keep on disk for log readers like read log and what we need to extract to ensure we, uh, we can get files off and not chew up too much disk space and all your rollbacks and crash recoveries can use. Like I said, log file size will probably still be used. And the key thing is that all your, all your paths um, should have this value, and the same goes with DPF, MPP, and PureScale. Pretty much that brings a wrap to the presentation. Um, here's a resource, obviously the RFE link or the ideas link. Go in there, get feedback, um, you know, communicate with me through Twitter. My Twitter handle was at the beginning of the presentation. Really, it's simple, at Roken, my last name. Feel free to message me. Um, talk on, you know, my blog is there as well. I do talk a lot about new features coming up. So this presentation is there. Talking about advanced log space management on a whole is there. Uh, other new features that come up over the uh, deliverables I'll be talking about there, plus some tips. So feel free to, to go there. Other than that, um, thank you everybody for listening in. I greatly appreciate it. Hopefully you've gained some value from this and you see some, uh, some things that you can take back and, and try out in the tech preview. And hopefully you're keen on, on putting into production use when we come up with full support down the road. Um, other than that, Martin, thank you as well. And uh, you know, any questions, if any, uh, we can, we can talk, uh, talk about and answer. Um, wow, that's a lot of information there, uh, Michael. I uh, didn't have anybody ask any questions, but I'm sure the uh, people have gotten a lot from it. I'm just going to ask our last polling question right now. Is, did you learn anything? And as I expected here, I'm going to share the results quickly. And the answer is, of course they learned something. There's an awful lot of information there. So with that, I'll, I'll hide that. Knowing that you've done an absolutely fantastic job, I will take over control here briefly to put up our, our uh, final slide. And uh, oh, rats, clicking wrong buttons again. There we are, that right click thing works a lot better. And there we are. And uh, there's my screen. Uh, we're, a little, uh, we're a fair bit over time, so I'm gonna cue the music. Thank you once again for doing a fantastic job. I love this presentation. And, uh, and uh, the replay will be up uh, within a day. So thanks to everyone, have a great weekend. If you're getting the uh, wet weather, stay dry. Uh, and we'll see you in a couple more weeks on the DVD Night Show again. Bye-bye, all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Okay, thanks. Take care, Martin.